The New York Mets made a big move on Wednesday to solidify their rotation, signing Jose Quintana on a two-year deal. Does this mean that they are all set, or are they still in the market for Kodai Senga? I'll discuss all of that on this edition of Locked On Mets. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you uh, amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on Twitter at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. We've had a busy morning, a lot to write about. Aaron Judge signing with the Yankees, Wilson Contreras signing with the Cardinals, But the big news when it comes to the Mets is Jose Quintana signing on a two-year, $26 million deal. Now, before we even get into who Jose Quintana is, if you aren't familiar with his work, let's just get to the contract, a steal for the Mets. Jose Quintana, Taiwan Walker, Jamison Tyone. Who had the best season of those three? Without a doubt in my mind, it's Jose Quintana. Now, is he older than those guys? Sure, he's going to turn 34 in January. But on a two-year deal compared to those guys on four-year deals, uh, let's just say I, I'm okay with the the age on Quintana because it's a short-term contract. And then you look at the dollars they're making. For Tyone, it was 68. Uh, for Taiwan Walker, it was 72, 18 million a season. You get Quintana at 13. That, that's $5 million less than Taiwan Walker is making now in Philadelphia. Love this move. Absolutely love this move. And you know what? He had a better year even than a Chris Bassett. I mean, you look at this season that Jose Quintana had. You have 32 starts, which is big time, all right? Made 20 in uh, Pittsburgh. Had a 3-5-0 ERA and 103 innings pitched. Then he goes to St. Louis with the Cardinals, gets traded at the deadline, and you are looking at a 2-0-1 ERA, 62 and two-third innings pitched. Doesn't strike out a ton of batters, but what he does limit is walks. Uh, For this season as a whole, he led the, uh, actually, he didn't lead the National League, excuse me. He led the the entire league in home runs per nine at 0.4, so that's keeping the ball in the yard. The walk rate was not the best in baseball, but still great at 2.6 per nine. So you limit the walks, you limit the home runs. He's a veteran who's done it before. You look at the innings totals throughout his career. And this is, let's see, I'm going to go from most innings pitched all the way down. 2016, 208 innings. 2015, 206 and a third. 2014, 200 and a third. 2013, 200 innings. So that is four years in a row where he was at 200 innings plus. Uh, 2017, 188 and two thirds. 2018, 174 and a third. 2019, 171 uh, total. And then this past year, 165 and two-thirds after a couple of down years, you could say. I mean, you look at what he did in 2021, didn't really pitch too much, and when he did, not effective at all. A 6-4-3 ERA uh, that was with the Angels and the Giants, and I don't remember him in either of those places, to be honest with you. Uh, 2020, only 10 innings pitched. So it was a rough couple of years, but prior to that, you know, you have what he did in Chicago with the White Sox. You had a year or two with the Cubs where he was solid. But the bottom line is this guy's going to eat innings for you. He's going to make 30 starts. And for a Mets team that you know needed to fill innings in that rotation, they've gotten two guys that went out last year and made all their starts and were healthy in Justin Verlander and Jose Quintana. You lose Jacob deGrom, who you had for 11 starts who I think still at some point a conversation can be had about your playoff rotation because I think your playoff rotation has taken a step back in the sense that Justin Verlander compared to DeGrom in a playoff rotation, there's a little bit of a drop back there, but I think you have a better chance of Verlander being healthy when you get to that playoff run and less risk on the deal. You know, you look at 
Now, who would you like more to start a playoff game, Chris Bassett or Jose Quintana? It might be a wash. I mean, Quintana did start game one against the Phillies and fared well in the wild card round, five and a third scoreless. Uh, but you could see him fading back and being a four ERA picture next year and not being the guy he was with the Cardinals. I, I think what you're getting here is dependable innings at a lower rate than anything else you were going to get in this middle of the rotation market. He ha- had a great season. If he repeats that, it's a steal of a contract. If he gives you one of the next two years at, again, a reasonable price tag where he's really good like he just was, great contract. But even if he is uh, number four and you have him and Carrasco this year, you get a good season out of one of them. David Peterson is good. I mean, you're just covering your bases. The real question here is when you get to October. When you get to October, do the Mets have the horses that they want? But I don't think that that's a problem now that you have to solve in December. You can see what's on the trade market after everything fizzles. You can trade for someone at the deadline. Who knows? Maybe there is a prospect that we're not expecting like a Dominic Hamill that bursts onto the scene. Or maybe it's a David Peterson who builds off of what was a really good season as a former first-round pick who had really high strikeout numbers, and he shocks us. And, and then now everything falls into place with Quintana and Carrasco being your back-end guys. There's a lot that can happen. But what the Mets just did is they solidified their rotation. If they can't do anything else, if everything else, the prices are astronomical, you could say, all right, we can roll with this group where you know McGill's now your six and you still have Lucchese and Budo and uh, Eleazar Hernandez. You got a lot of depth. Or... Maybe there's still that big move on the horizon this offseason. And really the only guy to look at now is Kodai Sanga because it seems like Chris Bassett likely off the table for the Mets after this signing. We're going to get to those two guys in particular in just a minute. First, though, today's episode is brought to you by BetOnline. Betonline BetOnline.net is your number one source for your sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional amateur league out there from football to basketball to soccer and esports. They've got it all covered over at BetOnline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, you can find those at BetOnline as well. BetOnline is always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting fixed. Who's left in free agency to bet on where they land? I imagine they still got Correa up there. Uh, Judge is off the board now, Verlander, DeGrom, all these guys you could have previously bet on where they would land at BetOnline. Head to the website today to see what's left or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in the action. BetOnline, where the game starts. Now, the New York Mets are reportedly still interested in Kodai Senga, who would take this rotation to an insane level. Let's just imagine first what that fit would be. If you get Sanga, he becomes your high upside three. He's got this ceiling that could be frontline. If, if he's the guy he was in the MPB, he comes over here and he can be more in your Tanaka class, your Darvish class of Japanese free agent starting pitchers. Unbelievable value. There's still that risk, though, that he is not what I think all these evaluators are hoping he can become. So there was some risk there. He's still out there, and if he wants to be a Met, if he meets with all these teams and he's taking his time, he's doing his due diligence, it doesn't seem like his market is developing quickly in the sense that he is really, really, really taking his time to make this decision, even though there's widespread interest. So if that market continues to develop slowly, but eventually he comes to the conclusion that, yes, he'd like to be a Met, well, now you have more leverage in those negotiations because, look, You don't have to get Kodai Senga. You'd love to have him, but you don't have to. So if they're able to pull it off, well, now you're looking at Justin Verlander, Max Scherzer, Kodai Senga, uh, Carlos Carrasco, and Jose Quintana, not particularly in that order, Quintana probably being your four, with Peterson suddenly knocked back down to be your six again. Um, And that would potentially put him in the bullpen. That would give you some answers at Longman. That would give you an incredible amount of depth. And also, if you really wanted to, I mean, David Peterson might have a lot of trade value. So let's just say that you suddenly sign Kodai Senga on a five- or a six-year contract. 
Well, now when you're looking at your future rotation, well, there's another guy that you're basically building around. Suddenly it would be the Kodai Senga rotation. He would be the longest term building block. You'd have these two mercenary future Hall of Famers in Scherzer and Verlander atop it with him to, to ease him into a, a eventual ace role potentially. And then you'd hope the prospects would filter in, but that would make a Peterson or a McGill a little more expendable if you had to go out and maybe trade for an outfielder. So these are all things that are fluid, and I think the Mets would probably prefer to keep their depth if they were to side Senga, but it just opens possibilities for you. And again, he would be the guy in Senga that you could think about in a playoff situation where suddenly you realize, oh, wow, he's actually living at 96 or 97 at the big league level. His splitter is which is nasty, is racking up strikeouts, and you're suddenly seeing this pitcher who is striking out 32% of their batters or the batters that he faces throughout a season. Now you're going into the playoffs, like, all right, we got three horses, and you still have guys like Quintana Carrasco and Peterson for depth. So I I would not discount the Mets' interest in Senga, but what this now did was it allows them to – properly evaluate that market and not overpay for it. That's the beauty of all of this is that you could sit back and go from that position of power where if Kodai Senga, who met with the Mets, his wife and Buck Showalter's wife were talking, she was the translator, they were all getting along. If he wants the big market as reported, if he wants to win now, now you let him come back to you. And you say, okay, well, that's what you, you're getting on the market. He might bring a contract that's more as well. Look, this is what we're comfortable giving you. You want to come sign it and be part of the Mets. And I'm sure it'd still be a fair offer, but maybe you can avoid paying top dollar, overpaying, and being the team that has to outbid the field to land this guy. The other aspect to all of this, though, is... For one, I think this really limits some of the other names the Mets would go after. They've been had some. They've had some interest in Ross Stripling, Chris Bassett. I think those are names that might now be off the table. And you also have to wonder when you're looking at team needs right now, and you have landed that starter that you, the second one you needed at a thirteen million dollar reasonable price tag. Could you instead decide to pivot also and just focus entirely on Brandon Nimmo? I want to discuss those options in just a minute, but first, another word from our sponsors. So let's begin with the starting pitching market and the other names that the, the Mets have showed some interest in. You know, Chris Bassett, I think they were always going to remain engaged on, but he wants a four-year deal. And when you look at Jose Quintana compared to Chris Bassett, you know, Quintana had a better ERA this season. I think Bassett's the better bet to be as good as he was this year again. But I don't think that's a drastically different odds on, on which one's going to perform in a similar fashion here. You know, Quintana has a longer track record in his career. He just has a more recent stretch of struggle where Bassett since coming off Tommy John has just been better. So I'm not saying that Jose Quintana is as good as Chris Bassett, but at $26 million compared to Bassett, who if I'm his agent, I'm now setting the starting point based on what Taiwan Walker and Jamison Tyone got at $80 million for at least four years. Uh, yeah, I think that this is a really good contract and you can wish Bassett the best like you did with DeGrom and let him get his big money contract elsewhere. Justin Verlander and Jose Quintana for two years, I do way prefer now in retrospect with some hindsight, with me being able to pull my Jacob DeGrom emotions aside a little bit. It's a much better move for this franchise and their sustainable winning than Jacob DeGrom and Chris Bassett on four and five year deals where you would really be locking up a lot of future spending. Quintana fits perfectly into what is now the Marte Scherzer Verlander window with Lindor being your anchor. And, you know, you still also have Alonzo McNeil for two more years of arbitration before their freeze, although I would hope the Mets extend those guys. With all that said, circling back to Senga, if the Mets have one more big signing in them, and a lot of bullpen additions that might come anywhere between, you know, I guess on the lowest end, a three and a half million dollar deal to, you know, ten million dollars per season. But you know, those are our contracts that Steve Cohen, uh, I'm sure, will welcome because most of those reliever deals would be shorter term anyway. 
if there's one more big money, longer term contract that the Mets are giving out, because they really haven't yet. It's Diaz at five years. And other than that, they've, they've kept everything short. If there's one guy that gets years, wouldn't you prefer Brendan Nemo over Kodai Senga? I know personally, that's where I would go. Because as much as I have hyped up Conforto to the Mets and still think it is a reasonable option if Nemo ends up elsewhere, Brendan Nemo is a better player who fits your team much better in center field. You keep Marte and right. And now, again, if you're looking at long-term money, there's not a Chris Bassett on the books for $18 million in you know 2025. That, that's just not the case. There's not a Taiwan Walker or Jamison Tyone at 18 or whatever Tyone got, 16 and a half or whatever the exact breakdown of that was. So your books are pretty clean. And Brandon Nimmo, I think, is worth it at this point to go out, solidify your lineup. You haven't really done anything to address your lineup at this point. You can stay internal at DH. You can trust that you'll get good seasons out of your veterans you signed last offseason and Marte, Escobar, and Canna. And you can really roll with what you have, assuming you bring Brandon Nemo back. So that's where my focus is now in free agency. Uh, we will see if there is anything else that comes out of the winter meetings. Otherwise, this was Thursday's episode of Locked on Mets a little bit early. Uh, but I imagine we could still see a deal and also, I guess if the Mets do anything in the Rule 5 draft, that would be worth noting as well. But but for now, that's going to be all for this edition of Locked on Mets. As always, thank you for listening. Make sure you follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. Make sure you follow me on Twitter, at Ficklestein Ryan. Follow the show, at Locked on Mets. Thank you for making Locked on Mets your first listen every day. Now for your second listen, check out Locked on Sports Today, hosted by Peter Bukowski, Locked on Sports Today, where you should go for everything going on around sports with instant breaking news, the take of the day, game reactions. You can follow Locked On Sports today on the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get podcasts.